I'm Benjamin Hall, and I'm Searching for Heroes. Well, ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much for joining me again today. And uh, today is again going to be an episode with no guest. And there is a reason that we're doing it this month and for this week, and that is because on Thursday, on March the 14th, it is two years to the day that um, the attack in Ukraine killed Pierre and Sasha and injured me. And, you know, for many people that I speak to who have been injured, who have in, in the military, they say that that day, the very day where that happens, is their alive day. And it brings back a whole lot of different feelings for each of them. Generally, it goes in two directions. Uh, half of the people come out of it, like myself, fortunately, really optimistic. It gives you so much opportunity. The other half of it, it is a day where they remember the, how terrible it was, the horror that happened that day and the pain that day, uh, and they haven't been able to get over it. But um, I have been incredibly lucky. And so I suppose today I also wanted to talk to you about what the day means to me, how I feel about it, how I feel about looking back at what happened to me on March 14th, 2022. You know, the people who are optimistic about that day, they say that it is, was a reminder to them that they are still alive. They've got so much opportunity that it is a second chance at life. Uh, and I see videos of, of, of people inside the hospital saying, this is the beginning of the next chapter for me. All the opportunities I had and discarded, I'm now going to grab. And in many ways, I feel exactly the same as that. There are opportunities which I perhaps was given before, but was a, a bit slow to react on them. I didn't grab them enough. I didn't appreciate them much. Well, that has totally changed for me. Um, whether it is the things I do with my family, ideas that I have, going out to places, doing, um, you know, playing specific games even with my children, I go out of my way to make sure I do those things because I regretted not doing them before. On a work level, I do so much more as well. This podcast, for example, is something that I had always thought about doing, but it wasn't really never really took the steps forward to do it. Now I'm doing that. Um, going out of my way and speaking to people who have gone through diff uh, interesting scenarios, bringing those uh, stories on air. Those are all things which I talked about doing, ideas for different projects, and now I go out to do them myself. So it's something that I think a way we should feel on every single day. That's, that, that's what I sort of want to say right now is that there are opportunities out there. And even if you haven't gone through something, we should wake up every morning and say, it is going to be a waste if I don't go out and grab those. It is going to be uh, an opportunity missed if I don't grab it right now. And so I'd like to say that you don't have to go through something terrible to get that opportunity, that optimism uh, and that drive. But, you know, in my case, it certainly pushed me on. And so I will think on March 14th, I will look back and I will think about how I mustn't waste the future. I mustn't, mustn't waste any opportunity that comes my way. And I don't just do that for myself and because I survived. I do it also for Pierre and for Sasha, you know, those are two people who will never have that opportunity. They died that day. And so um, I know that you must do it for them and in their names as well. So I suppose that's exactly what I'll be thinking about yeah. on Thursday itself. So, yeah, so for me, the alive day and what has happened over the last two years is that I have grabbed every opportunity that comes my way. And, you know, getting home to my family was an opportunity, but starting to work again and getting back to journalism, that was an opportunity I thought was absolutely essential. And so that's something which I continue to do now every day. And some of the guests I've spoken to, like Levi Rogers, and for him, after he was injured, after he lost his crew um, in Afghanistan, it was, it was start working again, give yourself something to drive towards, give yourself a real motive. Uh, and again, I think that's something that's important, not just to people like myself who have gone through something difficult and had to find a way through, but it should be true for absolutely everyone. Find something that motivates you in life. Um, there's a counter side to that, which is it's not just about having one idea and moving for it, moving straight towards that one idea. That is important, but you've got to be flexible as well. And again, we've spoken about that in this podcast. You set yourself goals. You have plans. Um but if, if if the plans that you had in your mind didn't work out, don't give up on them. Just find a different way or find a slightly different goal to work towards. And that way, the journey should never quite end. So for me, uh, I had a lot of plans, say, before the attack in March, 20, um, March 2022. Um, had plans. Because of the injuries, I couldn't see some of those plans through. There was some of the work I couldn't do, some of the direction I couldn't go. But that's okay. Well, the way I figured it is that you stop. You look at another direction, 
And then you grab a new goal. You keep moving towards that goal. And if for some reason that goal doesn't uh, appear, you find another goal. You keep moving. You never have to have to stop because one doesn't work. And so, again, I wish perhaps I'd be more like that before March 14th. And that is something that I learned during March 14th. I've also been over the last couple of years, one of the big things I've been thinking about is talking to people and the difference that I have found when people come up to talk to me. You know, they see the, the prosthetic legs. They, they kind of, they, they've heard many of them, what happened to me. And on the one hand, it, people come up and they just want to talk about uh, what the injuries are like, how I'm doing, am I getting better? And you know, I've answered those questions so many times. You just want to get onto other things. But I suppose that what has surprised me most is that after that, after people have gotten over you know, how you're doing, many of them have started opening up to me being really honest about difficulties that they're having as well. And I find that absolutely amazing because it didn't happen before. And what it is about the way in people want to react to me, I find amazing. Their mind has changed slightly, perhaps because they know I've gone through something which is pretty difficult. They feel confident in sharing what they're going through with me. And it just reminds me of how much benefit that does for everyone. And it's a reminder to all of you guys as well. When you talk to someone about it, when you mention it to someone, that helps all parties. And I know I've helped a couple of people who are having a couple of difficulties and they came up and they felt that for the first time they could talk to me in a way they couldn't before. And again, I think you shouldn't have to have gone through something terrible to know that, but it is something about society that sometimes keeps those feelings bottled up inside. And so get them out, tell someone, I believe that firmly. And I think that's probably been the biggest surprise to me as a result of the uh, attack and the injuries is people's ability and willingness to now open up and talk to me. But again, we should be doing that in normal life. You're listening to Searching for Heroes with Benjamin Hall. We'll be right back. I think what's also interesting is when, say, for example, I'm talking to people at the school gates and I'm picking up my children. What has always amazed me is how different it is in the way that children talk to me and how their parents talk to me. Uh, it comes back to the sense that you know, parents are perhaps aware that there's an elephant in the room or some of them don't feel comfortable talking to you about it. But, but children will come straight up, all of them, and ask, what happened to your legs? Where are they? Tell me about that, what happened. And, and I just think that's something amazing that we need to keep reminding people to do. You know, sharing in some way, trying to make our children continue to ask those questions the older they get, trying to make sure that they don't hide from things um, is really important. And so that's something which I've noticed uh, a fair amount. You know, when it comes to talking about my children, that's something else that has changed a lot over the last two years. There are a number of discussions that I'd always planned on having with them, whether it, uh, discussions about war, about injuries, uh, about death. Those are all topics we have to talk to our children about. And what I found was that I was having those conversations a few years before I thought I would. Almost immediately when I got back from hospital and I was back home, my children, who, who now are aged four, six, and eight, they would start asking me questions about what happened to me. They wanted to know how the injuries happened. They wanted to understand more about the bomb blast itself. And, and they were curious about, well, if you get burned, where were the flames? And that was one of the things that I had not or I thought about, but one of the things that I had to come to terms with. Instead of just hiding it from them, how do you best talk and explain to your children what happened? And so those conversations... Uh, I continue to have. They continue to ask me. What, every now and then they will point out a piece of shrapnel that's inside me. And when my children will say, what does the shrapnel feel like inside? When's that going to come out? Um, where did the shrapnel come from? And so th that's something which has been interesting for me to figure out, how to talk to them about it. And my answer to them is always as plain as it can be, but as 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 least graphic as it can be. So you know, I've had to explain, of course, that there are weapons out there, that there are good guys and bad guys, that there are places all over the world where sometimes the bad guys are trying to take things that aren't theirs, territory, houses, villages. So that's how I tried to start explaining it. And I said, some of those have weapons. Some of those weapons are used to prevent the good guys from protecting themselves. Um, so I try to bubble it down when I talk to them, and then I had to explain to them, in turn, then they ask, why do you choose to go and cover conflict? Why do you go out there, daddy, if it can be so dangerous? And then I have to explain the concepts of journalism. And again, that's something which I believe firmly in, but I hadn't 
plan to do it so early and have to explain to them that sometimes it is important to take risks of your own if it means you are going to bring the real news from the front lines, if you were going to tell people about the things that are happening around the world. And so those are discussions that I've been having with my children as well. And I don't mind that. It's earlier than I thought I would have to have it with them, but hopefully it's passing on the sense of right and wrong, good and bad, freedom against democracy, free speech against silence. You know, those are quite simple ideas which we can make very complicated as you get older. But for children, when you break them down, it reminds me a, how important they are and just how simple they are at their hearts. And okay, as a side note, you see how complicated people in politics make it all and how difficult it is to get anything done when actually at the bottom line of so many of these issues is pretty simple. There's right and wrong. There's a good thing to do and the bad thing to do. And so look, as parents, we have to do that. As journalists, we have to point that out as well. But I have over the last two years been going back to war and to some, some conflict a little bit. I was in Ukraine, I was in Israel, and I think that I hadn't expected to do that perhaps a year and a half ago when I got out of hospital. And yet I suppose I was drawn back to it. And again, I have to explain to my children why I want to do that considering the injuries that I currently have. But that's been a balancing act, I think, with the children. But they're amazing. And I think they children benefit when you are so open. The other people who I've been speaking to uh, have been US military medics. And I've given a few talks at the moment to the heroes of military medicine in Texas and to uh, the medics at uh, RAF Air Base Lake and Heath in the UK. I spoke to about 800 of them a couple of weeks ago, and it was about telling my story, telling what happened to me. But the reason that the, the officers asked me to come and talk to them was to remind many of these medics of some of the difficulties uh, of what they may go through in conflict. Many of them, most of them, did not serve in Afghanistan or Iraq. There is the next generation of people coming up. And so for our generation, so many, a whole generation in the military went out and saw what was happening. They were at the front lines, but the next generation don't. And it's amazing how many officers say to me, it's so important that they hear exactly how you were treated, what you went through when you know I was treated by US military medicine. And so that's a really interesting conversation also to have the young medics and to remind them well, of a variety of things. First of all, the reality of what it's like when you have to encounter someone who's been as injured as I, as I was injured. But then critically, I talked for a while about what their role was in talking to my family and to my wife. My wife has always said from the beginning that when I was injured and I went in, it was the way that the doctors and the nurses at Landstuhl, where I first went in Germany, talked to her, how they interacted with her. She said that the way they explained things to her made her feel comfortable and her feel comfortable made me feel comfortable. And that was a point I tried to explain to these medics as well, that it's being able to not just treat people on the battlefield, it's be able to, to liaise with the family. And that's what's so difficult for them. And the other issue I talked to these um, medics about was that it's quite easy for them to solve the physical injuries. Like if my leg's been, you know, been blown off uh, and I'm alive, you can fix that. You can fix it up, put a prosthetic on it, we'll sort that. But there are some mental issues and mental concerns which they may not be able to see. And as they are treating a patient, they need to think about that as well and try to identify that as well. Um, so we talked about that as well, the complexity of their role um, as medics in the US military. And of course, uh, I was asked briefly to talk to them about geopolitics because Again, some of their officers said it is so important for them to realize that we may not be fighting in Afghanistan and Iraq, but there could be an even bigger war on the way. You know, um, whether we are talking great nation states, countries like Russia, countries like China, it is important for people signing up and uh, to be medics in the military as well as you know, any, anyone in the military that we don't know what lies ahead. And you see the tensions that are rising, the way Russia continues to flex its muscles and talks about nuclear weapons, China uh, removing the word peaceful from its idea of um, taking over Taiwan in the big Chinese conference. Could that happen? And so one of the things that the officers wanted me to talk to these medics about is the very possible likelihood that they could well be in war as well and that they would have to prepare. And, well, I know I hope we... None of us want to come to that, but I think it's absolutely essential that we prepare, prepare in case we do. And so that's why I've been so honored to be able to talk to so many in the U.S. military medicine. And uh, I've got a couple more talks coming up with them. And if I can help in any way, it's great for me to do so. I must add that I was also given a private tour of an F-35 uh, jet up close by the crew. Uh, no pictures allowed, but I can say that, that was something I've always wanted to do. And 
what an incredible piece of machinery that is. Absolutely remarkable. But, um, so I got distracted by the F-35 right there. But the idea was to be prepared, is a message I sent to them, be prepared. And I think that that idea of being prepared is maybe one of the most important that I've learned over the last two years. And it is not just to be constantly prepared. What I've learned is that that is perhaps the most unhealthy for you. If you are constantly in a position of preparedness, you get worried, you get anxious, you think something's coming. What I have learned, and which I did for every little operation I had, every big operation, every part that was bad and painful, you have to learn when to fight and when not to fight. You have to know when there is something difficult that you've got to address, and then you've got to turn on the right mind to do so. And I think that that's something that is so important. It's when to know when you can turn it on and off. Choose it. it I, I do it all the time now. You know, well, not, not that often, but when something big is coming up, and that can be as something as a big interview at work or, or something doing... Now I know that instead of worrying about it all the time, I worry, I wait till it comes beforehand, I sit down, and then I turn it on. I prepare for it. And I know that whatever's coming, I'm ready for. And I don't think in the past, before March 14th, two years ago, I don't think I was ever in a position where I knew how to do that, or I recognize that I did that. But I think it has helped so much because it means I'm not constantly worrying about the next thing that's going to happen or what's going to come up next. I'm totally relaxed about it. I just know that as the time approaches, Give myself a target by which I have to get turn on, turn the focus on, and then be prepared for it. And that should happen both in situations like I went through back in Ukraine. And I remember when I was taken out of Ukraine, finally evacuated, made it to launch door. I, I knew that then, and I told myself that then. Even on the train out, those 10 hours on the train, which was so difficult, and the pain was, was so high, and just hanging on. Even then, I knew one thing. And that is, now's the time to focus. Now's the time to keep your mind on the one thing you need. Now's the time to find extra strength. And you can. You really can. And I was amazed that I was able to continue doing that when I needed to do it. And then try to relax when I didn't. So that's one of the things I try to do now. Try to find the right times to really focus on things. Uh, and then move on them when you have to. So I suppose um, in a roundabout way, those are a few of the things that I have been thinking about, some of the things that I have learned over the last two years. And what I like most of all is that they're not just what I have learned over the last two years. They're actually what so many people who I've spoken to on this podcast have learned. And if you listen to some of the previous episodes, you, you'll hear that. I mean, Aaron Ralston, he was the man who had his hand trapped under a boulder and he, he had to cut it off. Well, he knows how to do that. He found the time, for example, of when he needed that extra strength, when he needed to focus. And listening to that story was amazing because it reminded me of that. And then, of course, we spoke to Colin Campbell. He was, um, both of his children were killed uh, by a drunk driver while, while he was driving the car. And I suppose that's a really difficult one to talk about because of all the other ones I've guests I've spoken to, they have been such sort of optimists. They've gone through something really difficult and they've had injuries, but they've pulled through, you know, they've lost everything, but they've built it back up again. And I suppose Colin was the one guest I've spoken to where you can never quite replace that. That is forever gone. And so to be honest, that's one which I'm still thinking about. How do you build on loss like that? And so many of my guests talk about how to build on resilience, how to get through difficult things, when to focus, how to do it. But with Colin, it was the first time when I felt that I, I felt how hard that must be. And it's amazing how many other parents who have actually lost their children reached out to me after um, that that episode to say thank you for for letting him talk because it is such a difficult and such a unique tragedy that they went through. Um, so if any of you guys have ideas or suggestions, send them in as well. If you have an idea about that and anyone else, please do send those in so we can all talk about them. And perhaps for the next monologue, um, I'll take some of your questions and we'll talk through those as well. Um, thank you all for joining me. Uh, I hope you enjoyed the monologue. I know it was a bit freestyle, it goes left and right, but those are some of the thoughts that I've just been having. And I thought it best just to sit down and just to say, say them outright as they came from my mind. Um, 
So I hope you're having a great day. If you're not, know that it will get better. And keep looking ahead. If it's really difficult, you will find a way through. Thank you for listening, and we'll speak to you next time. Thanks for listening to Searching for Heroes. Listen ad-free with a Fox News Podcast Plus subscription on Apple Podcasts. And Amazon Prime members can listen to this show ad-free on the Amazon Music app.